This is part 5 titled Operating in Two Realms in this sermon series on spiritual realities. Be enriched as you listen. We're going to spend some time in God's word and then we will partake of the Lord's table towards the end of the service. Now, we have been doing a sermon series on spiritual realities. We've spent about four Sundays uh, talking about these things. And today we will bring this sermon series to a close, a conclusion. Uh, so this is part five in the sermon series on spiritual realities. In case you missed any of these sermons uh, that are part of the series, you're welcome to go to our YouTube channel or to our church website, apcwo.org slash sermons. You'll find all our sermons, sermon notes uh, available there. You can watch the video. You can download the MP3. Uh, you can download the PDF. Uh, if you want to use a PowerPoint and preach the sermons yourself, you're welcome to do that. Uh, all the sermons are available from 2004. That's almost uh, uh, over 16 years of uh, sermons. That repository is available. So make use of that. If you go to our church website, the homepage, you will see some of the recommended series, some of the more important series that we've done. Uh, there are, I think, over 50 of those sermon series that you could make use of and just strengthen yourself. Anyway, if you've missed any of the sermons in this series, you're welcome to listen to them. So what we have done very quickly to review is we began in part one talking about the unseen realm the reality of the unseen realm and uh, some aspects of this realm in which God exists. And then we talked about, in part two, God's perspective of uh, the natural realm. So we turn to say, you know, when God looks at what is going on on the earth, what are some of the things we need to keep in mind? How, how does God see all these things? So we spent one sermon on that. Then we talked about the believer's perspective. So as a believer, how do I look? Uh, how do I relate to the spiritual world? So we talked about the believer's perspective. We emphasized the need for believers to develop their spiritual functions. We stated that as believers, as people, really, created by God, we are really spiritual beings. And we have this house in which we live in order to engage the natural world. So we have our soul, which is the mind, the will, the emotions, the intellect. That's the soul uh, made up of the conscious and the subconscious mind. And then there is the body. So the spirit, which is the real you, uses the soul and the body to relate to the natural world. But we are really spiritual beings. Our spirits are eternal. Now we're going to die. They had a beginning. God created us in time. But from the moment of God creating us, we're going to live eternally. Our spirits are eternal, never die. So we need to develop our spiritual functions. We talked about, or we mentioned seven spiritual functions. And maybe someday in the future, I will talk about each one of them and how to develop the seven functions of the human spirit. That was in part three. And last Sunday, part four, we talked about engaging the spiritual realm. How can you and I cause the spiritual, what God has made available to us in the spiritual, to bear upon the natural, the things that we face in everyday life. And we uh, gave four simple rules of engagement. Last Sunday, we talked about the, the, uh, the importance of uh, uh, the cross of Jesus Christ, the fact that uh, uh, the basis on which we engage the natural world is the finished work of Christ on the cross. We talked about the uh, importance of submission to God. We talked about the importance of faith in God. And we talked about the importance of the words we speak, that by uh, these four rules, if we engage the natural world, we can keep things in our world subject to the things God has made available to us. So we keep, we let the spiritual dominate the natural in our lives as we journey through life. And we are not the victims of our circumstances, but we dictate to our circumstances. We're not the victims of the past or the present, 
and neither does the future have a control over us. We dominate the past, the present, the future in our lives by causing the spiritual to bear upon our life situations and our circumstances. Now, in this closing message in this series, part five, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the uh, how to operate in two realms. So I'm, I'm just uh, uh, calling this sermon operating in two realms. And uh, we want to understand the challenge we face as believers in the duality of existence. So, as we have said, we are spiritual beings, but yet we have to live in a natural world. And we spend, let's say, 70, 80, some go 90, some across the 100 uh, barrier, whatever. Uh, we spend, you know, approximately 70 plus years living in a natural world. Now, in view of eternity, this is very, very minute, very small. But at the same time, the time God has given to us here on earth is of eternal value. That somehow the things that we do, how we live this life, what we do with our time, the energy, the skills, the opportunities, all of these somehow have eternal consequences. And so we cannot afford to take our life on the earth lightly. So while we are spiritual beings, we also have a natural life to live. And so there is a constant tension that we face as believers in this duality of existence, meaning I'm a spiritual being. So there are several things the Bible tells you and me as spiritual beings uh, to consider. For instance, the Bible says we do not look at things um, at the natural, at the temporal, but we look at the things which are not seen, the eternal. So our gaze, our focus is set on spiritual things. The Bible tells us in Colossians 3, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So our affections, our passions, our interests are heavenly, more heavenly than they are natural. The Bible also tells us lay up treasures in heaven, not on earth. So I, you and I as believers choose to do that. We choose to invest in things that are eternal. And yet, while the Bible is admonishing us to focus on the spiritual, at the same time, we have to live in the natural world. You need money here on earth. Uh, you need money to pay your rent, to live life, to prepare for your future, uh, to take care of your family. So that's a practical, natural requirement. Uh, there, there are so many things that we have to engage in, in the natural. And so there is this constant tension in the life of a believer, the pull of the spiritual, the pull of the natural. And even the Lord Jesus said, you know, in Matthew 10, 16, he said, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. So he said, look, you know, I'm sending you to the world, but it's like sending sheep to the world, you know. Hey, they don't stand a chance. Jesus recognizes that. And then he says, there is an answer to this dilemma. What do you need to do? You need to be wise and harmless. That means you're not going to go there and be violent and fight your way through this. No, you're being harmless, but you've got to walk in wisdom. So he understands the dilemma, he captures the dilemma in sheep among wolves, that picture, meaning the sheep don't stand a chance, really. But there is an answer. Be wise like serpents, be harmless like doves, meaning don't fight, don't try to engage in the natural, fighting in the natural. No, be wise. Walk with godly wisdom is what he's saying. Or in another place in Luke chapter 16, when Jesus gave the parable of the unjust steward, he makes the statement, this observation. He says in Luke 16, I think it's verse 9, he says, the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. It doesn't have to be that way. But he's saying the children of this world, they are smarter. They are wiser than the children of light. The children of light should actually walk in the wisdom of God. But they're not paying attention to the natural, practical ways that they need to engage like this unjust steward. He's not telling us to be unjust. He's telling us to be shrewd. 
He's telling us to be practically wise, prudent. And that's the point he is bringing out there in Luke 16 and the parable uh, of the unjust steward, one of the points that he's bringing out there. So what we want to do in this sermon is try to understand a few simple things that we need to keep in mind as believers as we are in this tension of a duality of existence, meaning we are trying to live in two realms. How do we operate successfully in two realms? That's what we want to understand today. And I um, uh, have just broken this, um, uh, you know, the, the, this teaching into four simple points that you and I could uh, take, with, take back with us um, and uh, you know, help, uh, help, hopefully will help us resolve this tension of operating in two worlds, of this duality of existence. So let's look at these four points or four insights or four principles. Number one is simply develop your whole person, spirit, soul, and body. Develop your whole person, spirit, soul, and body. Like we saw in Scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23, the Bible tells us that we are spirit, soul, and body. And Paul is praying. He says, I pray, God, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, should the Lord tarry, he's praying, I-, I want you to be preserved. I want you to be kept whole, spirit, soul, and body. So as believers, we must understand the importance of developing our whole person, spirit, soul, and body body. Now, the problem the, or the dilemma many believers face is this, either the emphasis, they swing to one extreme. They focus only on developing the spiritual aspects, the spiritual functions, and they look at with disdain anybody who would spend time developing their soul, their intellectual part, or their physical part. You know, why are they so uh, worldly? You know, they are developing their intellectual, they're getting degrees, they're, you know, uh, you know uh, educating themselves, getting higher degrees, or, you know, they're spending time in taking care of their bodies uh, or enjoying something here on earth. So there is this constant tension. And so people, tend, believers, tend to swing to one side or the other, you know, either focus only on the spirit or some say, you know, let's leave the spiritual matters to, you know, those who are in the ministry. We'll just take care of all the natural and, you know, just get by spiritually. Just have, uh, you know, one cup of milk every week. That's enough to keep us alive spiritually. uh, And we'll just focus on the natural. So believers tend to swing either way. But what I want to challenge you as, as a believer is develop your whole person, spirit, soul, and body. And understand, and as we'll talk about in the second point, that wholeness has a blessing. That if you're whole, spirit, soul, and body, you can engage well in the spiritual world as well as engage well in the natural world. And that is what is going to make you an explosive force for God on the earth. If you want to be a person of influence and impact, if you want to be a person who can really, truly transform the world and have an impact on the world before you go to heaven, then you must develop your whole person, spirit, soul, and body. If you only develop your spirit and you don't know how to engage the world, then really you know, the 70, 80, 90 years that you spent on earth, how are you going to impact the world? Because you know, it, 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 we need to engage the world in natural ways, in meaningful ways. So uh, uh, understand that God is not against the natural. In fact, God created the natural. And God designed you and me not only as spiritual beings, but he also wonderfully and fearfully designed our natural, our mind and our body. Uh, He created such amazing parts of us, the mind and the body. So God is not against the mind. He designed it. God is not against the body. He designed it. So understand God is not against the natural. God is not against you developing your mind. So, you know, if you are... You know, you're in the IT industry, you're a software developer. Oh, no, keep on learning. Stretch yourself. If you're in the field of medicine or you're in the field of education, you're in the 
arts or you're in the entertainment industry, whatever industry you're in, engaged in, you know, develop your skills and, and develop yourself intellectually, keep learning, stretch yourself, push yourself, acquire new knowledge, explore new things. Uh, don't think God is against that. Of course, it's going to take time. So when you invest time to develop yourself in the natural, don't think God is against it. You see, the problem with many believers is they, be, they feel guilty when they invest in the natural. They feel guilty when they go out for a jog or when they go to the gym, they spend an hour exercising. So, oh, that hour I could spend in prayer. And of course, sometimes pastors will tell them, you know, instead of spending one hour in the gym, why don't you pray? Now, that's a very narrow way of looking at things because that one hour in the gym will help extend your life on earth you know, maybe by 10 years, and you can have 10 more meaningful, fruitful years on earth serving God than, uh, you know, living a short life and going to heaven early. You know, the past, pastor may not think like that, but you need to think like that. Yet you say, look, if I spend, you know, time exercising in my body, if I spend time developing my intellectual, it's going to help me have influence and impact for the kingdom of God here on earth. So don't feel guilty investing into the natural, your natural part, whether it's your mind or your body. Don't feel guilty if you're enjoying the natural things God has put around us. He designed it. He created it for our enjoyment. Enjoy it. I know our life here on earth is short, but... Don't feel guilty about engaging in the natural. In the, so take time for the spiritual. Take time for the natural. Take time for God. Take time to develop your mind, your body. Take time to for people. Take time to enjoy things around you in the natural. Don't feel guilty. God put us put all of that there for our enjoyment. So it, it develop your spiritual functions as well. Develop your spiritual a self by spending time in the Word of God, by spending time in prayer, in worship, uh, in, uh, in, in seeking God, in, in fellowship with other believers, being involved in Christian, active Christian ministry, whatever you can do, all of us can do something. So be involved, develop yourself, whole person, spirit, soul, and body. And remember, the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 6, 20, that our body belongs to God. God paid a great price for our body. So if he paid such a great price for the body, what price are you paying to take care of that body? You know, what price are you paying to take care of the body that God bought at such a great price? He says in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, that our body is God's. So whatever you invest in taking care of the body, just think about it from the light of the cross. Hey, God paid such a great price to pay, to buy my body. It's his property. What price am I paying to take care of it on a daily basis? You know, when you eat healthy when you exercise where you may spend a little bit more money on buying better food but that's okay you know it's for the health of your body god paid such a great price you can pay a little bit better price to take care of that body that god paid such a great price for and take care of it for one reason that you can live long and have impact and influence for the kingdom of god here on earth so you know so remember you need a strong healthy body and a healthy mind if you're going to serve the Lord. I mean, you could be a spiritual giant, but if your body and mind are gone, or what use will you be here on earth? You will not be able to help anybody. So while you and I must be strong spiritually, we must all, we also need a strong, healthy body and a sharp mind to be able to serve God here on earth. And understand this, that spiritual resources are released through natural means. For example, think about this right now, today, uh, we are under lockdown. But thank God for technology, that through technology, we are able to still come to you and bring God's word. But for us to be able to deliver the word of God to you, do you know that there are media people in church who work on the programs? Do you know there are IT people who, you know, who do a lot of, uh, take care of our websites and all of that? They are sharp in their skill. And without their help, this word will not be reaching you. So it takes, so spiritual resources are released through natural means. And thank God that they have developed their skills. They are investing hours and hours and hours of work every week, whether they are IT professionals or media people. Without their help, the word of God will not be reaching you or so many people. So the point is this. 
It takes natural means to release spiritual resources. So the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit, it comes to people through natural means. And so we need to know how to make use of those natural means to minister to people. So number one, develop your whole spirit, soul, and body. Uh, don't neglect any part of you. God designed all three parts. Develop it. Number two is this. Learn to blend the spiritual and the practical. Learn to blend the spiritual and the practical. Don't think that the spiritual and the practical are opposed to each other. They're not. There's a difference between the flesh and the spirit. We're not talking about the flesh. We're talking about the practical, the natural. The spiritual and the natural, let them learn how to blend it together. These are not enemies. God designed both. God created the natural. God created the spiritual. So the spiritual and natural, let them blend together in your life. The way you live life, let it be a symphony. Let it be a perfect blend of the spiritual and the practical. Now, let me just think, let's think through on this. You know, to know the will of God, you need to be spiritually keen. But to carry out the will of God, you need to be practically keen or sharp. So let's think about it. So if you want to know the will of God, Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 says, we, that we may be filled with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So it takes wisdom and spiritual understanding to know the will of God. Now that's important that we know correctly the will of God, you know, for your personal life, for what you need to do. You need to know the will of God. But for you to carry out the will of God on the earth, that's a practical matter. There's a spiritual side to it, which is to know the will of God. But then to carry it out is practical. You know, just a simple example. You know, we uh, started this COVID relief project uh, 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 from the, you know, we actually launched the project on the 12th of May. But from the 7th to the 12th, five days, there was the initial uh, preparation time. But we launched the project on the 12th of May. But, you know, that five days was a time that we took to know the will of God and get some practical things. I can remember uh, the 7th of May. That night, I didn't sleep much because my, uh, I, I was just thinking, God, should we do this or should we not do it? We had a meeting earlier that day. Uh, uh, sorry, it was, a, I think it was uh, Wednesday. Uh, I forget, the 5th of May or something like that. We had a meeting uh, with the pastors in uh, Bangalore and all of you discussing, you know, how do we help other people, God's people, going through the second wave of COVID. We had discussions and all that. And the rest of the day, I said, you know, it's one thing to have a discussion, but then you need to do something about it. It's the objective of the discussion is not to talk, but to come up with some ideas. And uh, how are we going to do this? How are we going to be do, you know, do something practical to help pastors specifically and God's people who have been affected by COVID, if, you know, many families have lost uh, either the, 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 the father of the house, the breadwinner, or sometimes both parents. Uh, there are others you know, who are in financial distress and so on. How do we do something practical? And that night, I, I just couldn't sleep. I said, God, what is your will? Should we step in or not? We are called to do spiritual ministry, but this is more like a social work. And uh, you know, I don't know whether we should devote time and energy into doing something like this. Uh, and so that whole night, I was you know, just thinking through, but more or more or less trying to seek the will of God for what should we do. But when I woke up in the morning, things were so clear. You've got to step out. You've got to do it. But here's how you do it. These are six areas that you need to focus on. You need to get up okay from the senior pastors in the city with whom you've interacted. Get there okay. Tell them that you know, we as a church will handle the entire project because we've got everything lined up. We've got our website. We've got a, you know, a, an email list of people across India. We've got our IT team. We've got everything in place. So all we need is them giving us an okay. So get there okay. Do it in a very honorable way. Get their approval permission that we will execute the whole project and then you know start with that get the approval of the trustees uh, apc trustees get their approval then you could go so that's what i did i woke up in the morning the next day sent an email to eight of these christian leaders and said you know here's a plan uh, there are these six areas we want to address but i won't ask you permission to let us handle this project on behalf of the whole body of christ uh, 
everybody, uh, you know, uh, emails just kept coming back saying, go ahead, we're giving you the thumbs up, check with our trustees, can we do this? We'll set aside a little amount of money, we get this project started. Trustees came back, go ahead, everything fell in place. And so there was a spiritual side, which is getting to know the will of God. But then once that was over, it took a team of people, more than 15 plus people to actually execute the project. The IT team was involved. They were uh, and you know entire team of 15 people doing calls, uh, following up with the requests. So within one week, we had 8,000 requests coming in, and we had to screen them. You know because it was an open thing. We don't know who all applied. Uh, we had certain criteria by which we had to assess each request in each of the six categories decide how much money to send. All the practical things had to be planned and had to be executed by so many people. The point I'm making is this, that there is the spiritual, but there is the practical. And these are not opposed to each other. The people doing the practical work are doing the will of God as much as those who are you know, spiritually seeking God about his will and direction. Both are important. So learn to blend the spiritual and the practical. Don't think that natural, the natural skills, the use of technology, the use of, uh, you know, proper decision-making process, the uh, having guidelines, uh, you know, firm operating procedures. Don't think those are a hindrance to the work of God. No, they are required for the execution of the will of God. And so excellence must be there. So we did training for the team, we constant weekly meetings, follow-ups, and you know, correcting each other in, in matters that when things are going wrong, uh, uh, pushing for excellence in every aspect of the work. Because it is one thing to know the will of God, it's another thing to execute it well, right? And you need the practical side. So in in, in, in second thing as believers, we must understand in this duality of existence is. Blend the spiritual with the natural and be good in both sides. Be good to discern the will of God spiritually. Be good in your practical work because it's going to take excellence to carry out the will of God here on earth. Another aspect of uh, blending the spiritual and the natural is, is learning uh, to, uh, uh, that takes us actually to the third point, which is to number three is to dominate the natural through the spiritual. Uh, the third point here is this, as believers, in our duality of existence, as we try to connect both realms, we must learn to dominate the natural with the spiritual. That means, you see, in the natural, we're gonna face all kinds of situations, all kinds of circumstances. You're gonna find obstacles coming along your path. Uh, you're going to find, uh, uh, you know, hard situations, difficulties, problems created by people who are trying to hinder you or trying to obstruct you or who don't understand what you're doing. Uh, you're going to find the enemy coming against you, trying to hinder you and doing all those things. So there are things you're going to face in the natural. Uh, there are dilemmas. There are difficult decisions. There are problems to resolve. Uh, and we must learn to address the natural from the spiritual. And let me just give two uh, kinds of examples. These necessarily don't cover everything, but just two examples. One is, you know, depend on the wisdom of God to solve problems. The Bible tells us in Colossians 2 and verse 3 that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That means in Christ, there's all wisdom and knowledge. And the Bible tells us this few verses on. It says, and we are complete in him, Colossians 2, 9 and 10. We are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. That means we receive completeness. We receive fullness coming out of Christ. In him, there's all wisdom and knowledge and we can draw out of that. So when we face practical situations, problems, whether you're resolving a a problem in, in the environment, trying to take care of the environment. Uh, maybe some of you are engaged in, you know, in this whole issue of climate change and how do we, you know, protect the environment that God has entrusted to us? How do we, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, this various factors that affect climate change, how do we address that? Maybe you are in the area of medicine. How do you treat patients? How, or maybe you're in the area of research, you know, how do I, Find out ways to address problems. They could be genetic disorders. It could be other kinds of problems. Um, and, and you're in, in the area of research. So whatever area you're involved in, 
Tap into the wisdom of God because in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So that is one example. By the wisdom of God, you dominate the natural with the spiritual. That means when you face problems, whether you're a salesperson, whether you're a business developer person, whether you're an engineer, whether you are an architect, whether you are you know, an entrepreneur, whatever, God, I need your wisdom to solve a problem. I need your wisdom in handling people. I need a wisdom in addressing this matter. How do I do it? And by the wisdom of God, you can dominate the natural. See, the Bible says wisdom is better than weapons of war. Wisdom can speak where money can't speak. A wise man, by his wisdom, can capture a city, can take a city. What people can't do with natural strength, through wisdom, you can accomplish it. So wisdom is better. And so through wisdom, we can dominate the natural. And as people who have access to the wisdom of God, we should be able to learn how to tap into it. So when you develop your spiritual functions, you can learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. How does, this Holy, how does the Holy Spirit communicate the wisdom of God to you? Whether it's a problem in everyday life that you're trying to solve. So you dominate, you address those matters, not just by your intellectual abilities, which you need to develop, but the Holy Spirit gives you the solution, the wisdom with which you can execute the solution using your natural, your ability, your skill and your talent and the expertise, your capabilities and so on. So that wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. Then you apply your skills to that, bring the solution in. So that's one example, one way by which you can dominate the natural starting from the spiritual. Another way is to exercise your authority over natural circumstances. You know, Jesus made an, a startling statement in John 3, verse 13. He said, you know, no one has gone to heaven except the one who has come from heaven, who is now in heaven. You know, Jesus was talking about himself, of course, in John 3, 13. He said, no one's gone to heaven except he who has come from heaven. That is talking about himself. He's come from heaven. And referring to himself, he says, that he is now in heaven. So you can imagine just standing there telling his disciples, look, I am here, but I'm also in heaven. So in the natural, he's there. In the physical, he's there. But in the spiritual, he's with the Father. And that is so true about you and me. The Bible says that we are here, but it also says our life is hidden with Christ in God. The Bible also says we who have joined to the Lord, we are one spirit with him. The Bible says we are seated with him in heavenly places. So you are here in the natural, in the physical, but you're also there in the spiritual, connected with God, with his omnipotence, with his omniscience, and with his omnipresence. And what God wants to do is express his omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence through us. We are earthen vessels, but little bits of God's omniscience, his knowing, his knowledge, his wisdom, Little bits of God's omnipotence, his miracle working power, his supernatural power. Little bits of God's omnipresence. Uh, well, he knows what's happening there. Uh, he knows what's going to happen. The ability to forecast, the ability to foretell, the ability to predict, to foresee. God wants to release that through us and express that through us. So when you and I face natural circumstances, we say, how can I dominate this with who I am in Christ? You do what Jesus did when he was faced with the winds and the waves, he said, peace be still. He rebuked the winds and the waves. He dominated the natural by the spiritual. So whenever you face something in the natural, understand there's a duality to yourself. You are also in the spiritual. And from the spiritual, you can dominate anything in the natural. We have said in the very beginning, everything in the natural is subject to the spiritual. Everything in the natural world is subject to the word of God because it was the word of God that framed everything. So understand the power of that word. And you can speak that word over the circumstance. You can speak the word over things in the natural. Don't let the natural hold you captive because you are a spiritual being and you can dominate the natural by living out of the life you have in Christ Jesus, by exercising your spiritual authority, by using the name of Jesus, by moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, by speaking the word of God, you can dom dominate the natural. So that's the third principle we must learn to live by. And lastly, the last principle I want us to understand in operating in two realms 
and operating in two worlds and this duality of existence, number four is simply this. Handle the temporal in view of the eternal. Handle the temporal in view of the eternal. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 8 through 10 and 17 and 18. We are familiar with these verses. You know, he says, We are hard pressed on every side, we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, we are not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. So he's saying, look, you know, we're facing all these things in the natural. We're going through hard times here. People are attacking us, doing all these things. But we are not discouraged. Why? And then he explains that in verse 17 and 18. He says, our light affliction is but for a moment and is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While they do not look at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are, tempor- which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He says, look, you know, what we're going through, these light afflictions, you know, actually, they're going through a lot, a lot of hardship. But he calls them, they're light afflictions. They're only temporary. They're only for a moment. But we've got an eternal weight of glory awaiting us. Because, and he explains that, he says, because, you know, we don't live life by looking at the temporal. We are looking at the eternal. We're not looking at what is seen. We are looking at what is unseen. So he's handling the temporal in view of the eternal. And that's how you and I should live life. In this duality of existence, it's operating two worlds. You know, don't stress yourself out with you know, things that people say and do. Just say, you know, in the light of eternity, those things don't matter. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is not going to ask you, what did so-and-so say about you? Or what was, the peop- what was your reputation on earth? Did everybody clap for you? Did they say nice things about you? He's not going to ask any of it. Not one single word anybody spoke about you on earth is going to matter before the judgment seat of Christ. doesn't matter. Or there, what matters is, Did you honor the Lord with your life? Did you do what he wanted you to do? So don't even be bothered about your reputation. Who cares what people say about you? Because in the light of eternity, it means nothing. Absolutely nothing. So don't sweat yourself about it. You know, handle the temporal in view of the eternal. People, some people may applaud you on earth. Some people will criticize you. Some people will understand you. Some people will misunderstand you and some people won't understand you. Doesn't matter. In the view, in the light of eternity, none of these things matters. So don't get obsessed. Don't get upset. Don't get disturbed by these things. Just let them go. Like they say in English, like water off a duck's back. Just let it go. Doesn't matter. Just don't let it trouble you. You know, the moment you and I step into this realm where we look at the temple in view of the eternal, None of these things will move us. None of these things will affect us. None of these things will disturb our peace. Because we are looking at all these things in view of the eternal. They don't matter. The same thing with how you handle money. The same thing with how you handle relationships. The same thing with how you handle other matters of life. Deal with them from an eternal perspective. So when you look at money from an eternal perspective, you say, you know, What really matters is how well I steward this, how well I can bless people, how well I can extend God's kingdom. Of course, I'm going to use some to, you know, take care of myself and enjoy uh, enjoy life, enjoy the journey. But I also want to do something to bless others because you're looking at it from the view of eternity and every other matter. So hold the temporal or handle the temporal in view of the eternal. To conclude here, Four simple principles that will help you and me operate in two realms, uh, 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 live life, uh, uh, go about this duality of existence. I want to just quickly review these four points. Number one, we said, develop your whole person, spirit, soul, and body. Remember, God created you, spirit, soul, and body. He purchased you, spirit, soul, and body. He paid a great price for your spirit, soul, and body. So take care of it. Develop it. It's something you do in honor of the Lord. Number two, learn to blend the spiritual and the practical. We need to be good at both. We need to be good spiritually. We need to be good practically. Number three, 
dominate the natural through the spiritual. Whatever you see in the natural, think about this. I am also seated in heaven at the right hand of God in Christ. How can I handle it from there? I can decree. I can exercise authority. I can dominate it. So don't let the natural hold you captive because you are a spiritual being. Number four, handle the temporal in view of the eternal. Look at everything in the temporal with your eyes on the eternal, on eternity. Suddenly, their value, their significance diminishes, changes in view of eternity. Handle the temporal in view of the eternal. I hope these four simple truths will help us learn how to live in the natural as spiritual beings, operating in both realms effectively, powerfully, so that we can live lives that have great influence and great impact for the kingdom of God. We're going to prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's table. Uh, it is a very powerful expression of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 that the bread we eat, it's communion in the body of Christ. It's sharing in the body of Christ. What he finished for us through his work on the cross and what he has given to us as being part of his body, fellowshipping with other people. The Apostle Paul also says that the cup that we drink, it's a cup of blessing. That means I'm receiving the blessing of the cross. I'm receiving the blessing of the new covenant. So today, I want to encourage you to prepare those elements before you get the bread, juice, or water, whatever you have. Keep it before you. Um, if you are in a family, I would request the head of the family to pray over these elements as we pray. If you're by yourself, just pray by yourself. That's fine. And we're going to pray, and we're going to partake of these elements. And while we do that, I want you to expect saying, God, I receive the blessings of my covenant with you. I receive the blessings of the cross of Jesus. On the cross of Jesus, forgiveness was provided. Healing was provided. Wholeness was provided. Deliverance was provided. Victory over Satan and all his works was provided. The blessing of God was provided for everything that God could give you. He has provided for you through the cross. So as you and I partake of this, say, Lord, I receive this for myself, healing for my body, strength for my body, healing for my mind, and I receive it. Let's do that. I want you to just keep the elements ready in front of you, please. And we're going to pray, and then we're going to partake of these elements together. Let's take a moment to pray and then believe God to receive are the blessings of our covenant with God. Father, we consecrate these earthly elements of bread and juice that speak to us about the Lord's death, that Jesus paid a great price for our redemption. We are the redeemed of the Lord. God, your word says that we who have received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, we will reign in life. We will dominate in life. We will rule in life through Jesus Christ. We receive the full blessings, healing, deliverance, victory, salvation, preservation, protection, provision. We receive full blessings through the cross. Father, I pray that everywhere as people partake at the power of your Spirit, touch each one, bringing the power of the cross into their lives. The Lord Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. The Lord Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many 
for the forgiveness of sins. The Bible says that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. The Bible tells us that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. We partake of this cup knowing what the blood of Jesus has done for us. Let's partake together. So Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray with each person listening. I take authority over every work of the enemy, their bodies, their minds, their life situations, their circumstances, their relationships. I take authority over every evil work. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I command every work of the enemy to be destroyed. I command every work of the enemy, every work of oppression, every work of torment to be destroyed. A command that people are released from every oppression of the enemy in the name of Jesus. A come again against every foul, unclean spirit, every spirit of torment, every spirit of oppression. I command you to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. Be free in your mind. Be free in your emotions. Be made whole in Jesus' name. Every spirit of infirmity causing sickness, ailments, I command it to leave. And in Jesus' name, receive your healing right now. Every spirit of bondage, every spirit that holds people in addictions, I command them to leave. Unclean spirits, I command you to leave. Command people to be free in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for what you do. Thank you that you know each person by name. You know each one's circumstances. You know each one's situations. Thank you for ministering to them, touching them, healing, delivering, intervening in their lives. Thank you, Father. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, oh God. Thank you that you're hearing the prayers of your people right where they are, in their homes, in their rooms, living rooms or bedrooms, wherever they are watching, you're hearing the prayers. Thank you, Father, for your intervention. Thank you, Lord God. Father, I praise you and I honor you. I bless you, oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. I praise you and I honor you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, God. I'm just uh, seeing somebody here who is watching right now. You are a person, you're running a children's school. I see children playing there in your school. But right now, in this season, this time, you're in a difficult position. You're, never, uh, you're not sure if you're going to be able to reopen your school, uh, to have those children back in your school. Uh, but I'm just, I'm just seeing that situation. I'm seeing you pray. And concerning that, and right now, in Jesus' name, I speak into your situation. I speak a supernatural intervention into your situation in the name of Jesus, decreeing for you that you will be able to resume your school. You will be able to have things running up and again. You don't have to give up. This is not the end, but it is a new beginning. I speak a new beginning for you, for your children's school. I see children there for your children's school. And I speak a new beginning for you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let this be done. Receive it. Receive that. God, we thank you for your intervention in this situation, God, that those who are in that position and they receive it, thank you for doing it for them, that you would cause things to come together. It's not the end of that work, but God, you give them a new beginning. Father, I praise you and I honor you, God. And I bless your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. And I praise you and I honor you, God. Father, we thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for uh, your intervention in our lives, God. Thank you. I uh, praise you. Honor you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. Thank you. And we praise you. We honor you. Father, we just pray uh, for 
every need that's being raised up to you right now. Thank you that you meet every need. Thank you, Lord God. Speak your blessing into every household and every family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm going to let the worship team lead us in a time of worship. You know, we would love to hear from you that um, share with us what God has done to you, for you, through this service. If we've been encouraged through the time of worship, you've been encouraged through the ministry of the word, you've been ministered to during this time of prayer, send us an email to testimony at apcw.org. We'll be delighted to hear from you to know that uh, this service has been of a blessing to you. The worship team is going to lead us in worship. Stay with the team. They will worship and we will close right after that. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands and worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands and worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands and worship as we glorify. Thank you, worship team. Let's receive the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thank you once again. Please remember to visit our church website, apcwo.org. Make use of all the free resources. Spread the word. Share as much as you can. God bless. See you again. Bye. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, publication, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcbiblecollege.org. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play Store.